Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Hello and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Rhonda Schapler, in for Brianna Venosi. Governor Murphy said today he believes we are on the tail end of the latest Omicron wave, but adds that no one should be complacent even as numbers decline. The state reported just over 4,300 confirmed positive COVID tests half the number reported yesterday, and 24 new deaths. State Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli says hospitalizations likely peaked two weeks ago. Recognizing that we are not free yet from the virus, the governor urging residents to continue to wear masks, especially when indoors, and to get vaccinated and boosted because only half of the state's residents eligible for a booster have received one. In response, Murphy announced the opening of two new vaccine megasites, one in Bergen County and the other in Passaic County. Meanwhile, the governor is also touting a new mortgage assistance program for eligible homeowners struggling to pay their bills. Registration for that program will open two weeks from today. While COVID cases are indeed falling, the state also reported some disturbing news. Several children, including three infants, have died of COVID since December. And last week, six kids were admitted to the hospital with a severe COVID complication. As senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports, parents of young children who are unable to get vaccinated are counting the weeks until a vaccine is available. I have been wanting to get my daughter vaccinated. Um, I am a firm believer in vaccinations. But Lauren Anderson's four and a half year old Ariel is too young for COVID shots and it's uncertain when a vaccine for kids under age five might get FDA authorization. Meanwhile, Ariel attends pre-K classes with other unvaccinated classmates. And I don't really wanna play Russian roulette with my kid. Um, and, it, you know, so it's been hard. That's my biggest fear is that, you know, she'll be that one in a few thousand or one in a million that has an underlying condition that we just did not know about. The latest data from New Jersey health officials are concerning. Health Commissioner Judy Persichelli reported four children have died of COVID since Christmas, three of them infants. Overall, the virus has claimed the lives of a dozen New Jersey kids, eight of them under the age of five. She also says hospitals last Friday reported six children admitted with a severe COVID complication called MISC, the most in a a single day and that none had underlying conditions. Persa Kelly advised. I want to remind parents to take all necessary precautions to prevent infants from exposure to the virus. This includes making sure those around your infants are up to date on COVID-19 vaccines and avoid crowded gatherings. We are seeing younger kids coming into the hospital setting and we're talking about kids between the ages of six months to about seven to eight years. Um, we have over the last two weeks seen an increase in the multi-system inflammatory syndrome presentation. Dr. Uzma Hassan says she's seen a 30 to 40 percent increase in MISC cases. Her pediatric practice also noted a spike in so-called long haul COVID amongst mostly unvaccinated kids. It's estimated five to 10 percent of kids with COVID can develop long haul symptoms like fatigue, aches and palpitations, says Dr. Meg Fisher. The most upsetting or the most concerning is this so-called brain fog, where you, where you can't really concentrate. Some children can't read at the same level they read before. They can't do mathematics anymore. 
their spelling deteriorates. Clinics report both kids and adults with long-haul symptoms improve after receiving COVID vaccinations. And when parents with kids under five heard Dr. Anthony Fauci predict last week that the vaccine might be available by February, they cheered. But researchers say it requires a third dose to be most effective for children aged two to four. It's going to take a little longer to get those data to the FDA and approve. My hope it's that it's going to be within the next month or so. Investigators running the Rutgers pediatric trial will meet with Pfizer officials tomorrow, and former FDA chief Scott Gottlieb sees a longer wait time. You're looking at a timeline when this would get pushed at best, perhaps to into late March, because you'd have to re-adjudicate the data, have an ad com, get the vaccine out into the supply chain. By the time that happens, I think you're looking at a March date, maybe late March. So I don't think this is something that's going to happen in the next month. As a clinician, I would say I can't wait. <laughs> I think the sooner, the better. I'm just happy that it, it's here. It's around the corner. It's coming. Amira al Ghunami's four and a half year old daughter who attends daycare isn't vaccinated yet. Her six year old son is. She's more than ready for the whole family to be jabbed and protected. Seeing my son go through and having no issues, really just arm soreness, nothing more than a flu shot, then, you know, I'm, I'm more than confident that when it comes to her turn, it'll be um, pretty much the same exact reaction. And with more kids getting sick, there's a heightened sense of urgency. I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. When it comes to redistricting, the census tied redrawing of voting maps you mostly hear about the congressional maps and how they may affect the midterm elections and the balance of power in Congress. But on the local level, across most of the state, cities, and towns, local redistricting commissions are giving ward maps the once-over in order to ensure equal population among local voting districts. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports on the forces at play when a city is changing. We've always called wards by names, right? Greenville, West Side, Journal Square, The Heights, downtown, Bergen Lafayette. And now it's harder to call them that when The Heights is now down to the water and Bergen Lafayette has no more Lafayette. County Commissioner Bill O'Day grew up on the west side of Jersey City. He's a former councilman there and has been through decades of ward map updates. This week, he was one of more than 200 spectators in person and remotely who attended the usually sparsely attended Board of Ward Commissioners meeting. The commission doesn't use ward names. In this new map, the wards are lettered. This is the old map. Take another look. New, old. Doesn't look like much of a difference, but if you look more closely, you'll find that the ward lines could be making a big difference. For me, when I'm looking at a jurisdiction and I'm seeing zigzag cuts, um, one just have to think that this is specifically targeted at me trying to punish voters who voted for me. You cut out a, a historically black district. And to my recollection, I, I would make the argument uh, that this may be the oldest black district in the state of New Jersey and you purposely cut it out, um, like strategically you cut it out because there's no straight lines, there's nothing compact or contiguous about the map. Councilman Frank Gilmore is a political opponent of Mayor Steve Fulop, whose chief of staff chairs this commission. He says the new ward lines cut the black and brown vote here by 12 percent. He's not the only one. To see the, how the ward was uh, stretched from from one portion of downtown all the way up into uh, the middle portions of Greenville, like that's just re reeks of dilution. And then to to reduce the number of uh, black voters, you know, inside of the uh, ward the way they did was, uh, I mean, further disfranchisement. But it's more than just voters getting shipped to other wards. Some critics of the commission say they're serving the needs of favored developers. A long stretch of Communipor Avenue has been moved out of Ward F, as has Liberty State Park and the Liberty Science Center. Developments along Communipore Avenue and projects like Sci Tech City, adjacent to Liberty State Park, faced opposition from Gilmore and members of the community. The contours of the current Ward F, if you 
type in your Google search image, gerrymandered district, and then hit images, you would see something that looks like this current contour board up. Former city attorney Bill Matsakoudis represents one group opposed to a development next to Berry Lane Park. In fact, it was a major election issue and arguably one of the reasons why Frank Gilmore defeated someone who was on the incumbent mayor's slate. Suddenly, after the election, that parcel of land is taken out of the war. Whether it was by design or not, taking that, pro that parcel out of Ward F uh, is very problematic. The mayor says he's staying out of the ward map squabble. No one from the commission would talk to us today. The truth is, though, that nobody knows what the next 10 years will bring. The new map moves Greenville into Lafayette, which actually began as Communipaw over a century ago. And parts of Ward E, a.k.a. downtown, will now be in Ward D, a.k.a. the Heights, even though it's still at sea level. That's the slow evolution that changes neighborhoods with names into wards marked by letters. I'm David Cruz, and J Spotlight News. Hoboken residents will go to the polls tomorrow to vote on a proposal to spend $241 million to build a new high school in the city and to reconfigure other schools. The district says its plan would address both enrollment changes and old, outdated buildings. But critics say the proposal needs more input from the public, and they point out approval would mean tax increases for homeowners. Under the plan, a new high school would be built, and the existing high school would turn into a middle school. The middle school would then become an elementary school. New Jersey police officers can now review footage from their body cameras as they write their initial police reports under a new law signed by Governor Murphy last week. But critics are concerned about the potential consequences of the bill, saying it undermines New Jersey's effort for better police transparency. Melissa Rose Cooper has our report. It's troubling and it's an under, it undermines New Jerseyans' rights. Sarah Fajardo, policy director for the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey, reacting to a new law allowing police officers to review body camera footage in certain instances before completing their initial reports. It really provides the potential to pollute and um, uh, make less precise the reports that we get from our law enforcement officers, which are a really critical tool to understand what happens at the scene. Um, we really want to understand what the officer's memory looks like as an independent piece of evidence um, from body-worn cameras, because we do know that every human brings their own personal perspective, right, their own subjective understanding of an in incident. And so if an officer is committing misconduct in a situation, we also need that evidence to make, you know, a best kind of interpretation of what happened in what can be extremely intense and busy and um, stressful situations. Governor Murphy signed the controversial measure into law last week after issuing a conditional veto in November. The governor suggested lawmakers amend the bill to include certain provisions. Under the law now, police are prohibited from reviewing the body camera footage first if an officer uses force, discharges a firearm, or uses deadly force, and if a person dies while in custody. I think that that's actually a step in the right direction. Sayreville Police Chief John Zabrowski says he understands why some people are concerned, but wants New Jerseyans to know any footage viewed would be used as a supplement to the police report, not a replacement. So let's begin with an officer at the scene would record contemporaneous notes, which they normally always will do. And then when they go back to complete their report, they're gonna to refer to their contemporaneous notes. And if it's, they feel it's necessary to review body-worn camera footage, they'll also note that in the report that they're using their review as part of the completion of the report. So I believe that that should take some of those concerns away from those that feel that there would be um, inaccuracies as a result of watching the body-worn uh, camera uh, footage. Then what was wrong with the original law? The original law that was passed in November of 2020 asked an officer to write their notes, then enabled them to look at their body camera footage, and then to make any changes 
based on what they saw in the film. And that way we preserve everything, right? We preserve both the officer's memory at the time. We know what they remembered and what they perceived. And we ensure that reports are accurate by giving the officer a chance to watch the film. Supporters of the new law have argued letting officers see the body camera footage helps accurately detail what happened. But others believe it will make it difficult to hold law enforcement accountable and determine the motivation and intention behind their actions. What we see from the science, especially since about 2015, is that when officers view the footage prior to actually writing down the incidents, like what actually happened during the course of the incident, their actual factual events change and it changes their memory of the events. And so if the goal is to get the most factual understanding of what happened during the event, having them view the body camera is good. If we want to see how officer behavior may not always align to what is actually going on, it doesn't give us a true representation of that. Community advocates are hoping lawmakers will take another look at the issue and revert the body camera legislation back to what they passed in 2020. Attorneys I spoke with say if the truth behind a case is ever threatened by an officer reviewing footage, they'll take the necessary steps to challenge it. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. It's time for New Jersey to abolish the position of constable. That's the conclusion of a scathing report released by the State Commission of Investigation. The report, which came out late last year, finds constables are outdated relics that don't have a place in modern law enforcement. The commission found that in some cases, constables take questionable and even unlawful actions that can endanger the public. To find out more, I spoke with the commission's Kathy Hennessy Riley. What exactly is a constable? Why do we have them in New Jersey? And why do they differ from sworn police officers? So constables are politically, municipally appointed civilians. Um, and the practice of appointing constables dates back to the colonial era at a time when, you know, organized police departments didn't exist. Constables were the primary form of law enforcement back in those times. The problem is the position has still exists, even though we have a very highly sophisticated, highly organized modern policing system, yet we still have constables. Uh, what has happened in New Jersey is we found that these constables who really have uh, unclear authority, have no training and no oversight, some of these constables have believed that they are authorized to uphold laws and enforce them just like sworn police officers would. Um, the problem is they really, their authority is unclear. So there's a, a lot of confusion as to what exactly do they do. Um, and what we found is it really varies from town to town. In some towns, they're nothing more than a political appointment, a ceremonial type position. And in some places they do have low level policing duties like uh, you know, writing littering summonses and such. The problem though, is this small group of, of uh, a core group of constables who believe that they're actually have the powers of sworn law enforcement. They dress like law, sworn law enforcement. In fact, to the you know, uninformed public, you would see one of these constables and think it, he was a sworn police officer. For these particular constables, the example you just gave, is it dangerous to have them on the streets? Well, we were told by sworn law officers that they have a real concern that if, at best, the public could confuse a, a constable with a sworn law enforcement officer. At, at worst, they could be a real danger because some of these constables have inserted themselves into developing police situations including active shooter situations or have tried to pull over vehicles. So yes, I mean, there, we found that these have the potential for danger, not only to other law enforcement and to themselves, but also to the public at large. What does the report recommend in terms of what to do with constables? The commission's report recommended abolishing the position. It's our belief that given the highly sophisticated and uh, well-trained law enforcement system that we have in place, there's really no real need for constables anymore. Um, so we, we recommended that just getting rid of the position is probably the best way to go. Kathy, thank you for your time and for sharing the information in the report. Thank you. 
In tonight's Spotlight on Business, a breakdown of Governor Murphy's handling of high taxes in New Jersey. You may recall that during last fall's gubernatorial campaign, opponents portrayed Governor Phil Murphy as dismissive of concerns about high taxes. However, during his second inaugural address, Murphy highlighted more than a dozen individual tax cuts that have been enacted since he took office in early 2018. We asked budget and finance writer John Reitmeyer to do some fact checking on tax cuts, and he joins me now. John, good to see you as always. The governor has claimed to have lowered New Jerseyans' collective taxes by millions. You crunched some numbers here. What exactly has he done? So he's done tax breaks for college tuition or for low wage workers or senior homeowners who need relief on their property taxes. And so Murphy's slate of tax cuts have been more targeted to specific groups. And that's where you see a lot of the, the savings coming. And they've also come some of them in just the last year. So taxpayers not be uh, fully aware of some of these cuts you know, until they actually do their, their tax uh, forms this year. And I guess that approach might explain why Republicans say that Murphy is not the tax cutter he's claimed to be. What do they think he needs to do? Well, we also have to remember that during Murphy's tenure, several taxes have also been increased. Um, and it's been sort of the inverse of the targeted approach. Um, this is targeted towards namely millionaires and top earning businesses are paying more. And so where Republicans want to see more tax relief is for businesses. Uh, they, they've been hit with payroll tax increases that are required to replenish the, the balance of the unemployment trust fund. And they wanna see the, the government do more to help blunt those tax increases. And also, you know, we're in a period of inflation and Republicans have talked about linking income tax rates at the state level to the rate of inflation, which is something the federal government already does. John, even with these tax cuts, spending has increased under the governor. So how is he paying for everything? Well, in the near term, the current budget, you know, used some of the budget reserves to balance spending with, with uh, revenues. And so that's the big question going forward is how do you maintain balanced spending when you've cut taxes, but you've increased expenditures? And so, like I said, this, this current budget, they had to dip into reserves. We may see, you know, revenues pick up. But if they don't, that creates what are known as structural budget gaps. And then, you know, you either have to do cuts or you have to increase taxes. And so we're going to have to see how he navigates what can be a tricky situation. Affordability is now the big buzzword in Trenton. Is there a balance of affordability in the state when we look at our tax picture? I think that's really always the tension. And with Murphy, it's been a little bit of it depends on you know where you sit in the income uh, bracket structure. You know, he has targeted some relief toward lower income uh, New Jersey residents, you know, seniors and uh, middle, even middle income property owners and families. But definitely across the board tax cuts that would address affordability for everybody, even upper middle class. Um, that's not something that we've seen from Murphy yet. All right, John, thanks. Good to talk to you. Same here, Rhonda. Thank you. On Wall Street, stocks recovered from early steep losses to close higher. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case challenging affirmative action in college admissions. The court says it will take up lawsuits claiming that Harvard University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill discriminate against Asian American students. Both lawsuits were filed by Students for Fair Admissions. In the case of Harvard, the group claims that the Ivy League school imposes a racial penalty on Asian American applicants by scoring them lower in some categories than other applicants and that Harvard awards massive preferences to black and Hispanic applicants. Harvard denies that it discriminates against Asian American applicants. 
Lower courts have rejected the challenges, citing more than four decades of high court rulings that allow schools to consider race in admissions decisions. But colleges and universities must do so in a narrowly tailored way to promote diversity. Affirmative action was sanctioned by the court in 1978 to consider race as part of the admissions process. The Supreme Court is expected to hear arguments this fall. That does it for us tonight, but head over to njspotlightnews.org and check us out on our social platforms where we keep you updated with the very latest news that is impacting the Garden State. I'm Rhonda Schapler. Thank you for being with us tonight, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSEG Foundation. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the social service and nonprofit pioneers who lend a helping hand, science and technology innovators, the men and women who provide our skilled labor and our homegrown champions, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. If you need to see a doctor, RWJ Barnabas Health has two easy ways to do it from anywhere. You can see an urgent care provider 24 seven on any device with our telemed app, or use our website to book a virtual visit with an RWJ Barnabas Health medical group provider or specialist, even as a new patient. You've taken every precaution, and so have we. So don't delay your care any longer. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.